Welcome everyone. On behalf of Louisiana Public Broadcasting and the Southern University Law Center, we would like to thank you for joining us for this virtual screening of Stories for Justice, three film shorts on criminal justice reform from independent lens. I am Robin Merrick, Vice President of External Affairs and University Relations for the Southern University System. Our distinguished panel includes the filmmaker and reporters for the parish prison and two of those individuals who were interviewed in the film. Before I introduce them, I'd like to remind you to share your feedback with us by clicking the orange button on your screen that says participate in the survey or clicking that same invitation you see in the chat box. One survey taker will win a year's membership to LPB Passport, the online streaming service of the best of PBS. And now let's welcome our special guests and panelists joining us this evening. First, we have Joanne Elgert Jennings. She's the filmmaker for the Parish Prison. She is a multimedia journalist and executive producer of World Affairs, a radio program syndicated on NPR stations. As a producer for PBS NewsHour for more than a decade, Ms. Jennings produced award-winning documentary series from around the world. Her work has been honored by journalistic organizations, including the National Academy of Television, Arts and Sciences, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Jamila Johnson is the managing attorney for the Jim Crow Juries Project for the Promise of Justice Initiative. Ms. Johnson uses litigation, policy, and public education to restore dignity and fairness to Louisiana's criminal justice system. Before joining the Promise of Justice Initiative, she led the Louisiana Criminal Justice Reform Team at the Southern Poverty Law Center. Ms. Johnson served on the steering committee for the Unanimous Jury Coalition and has been in leadership for Louisianians for Prison Alternatives since 2017. Bryn Stoll is a reporter for the Baltimore Sun. Prior to this, Mr. Stoll was a reporter at the New Orleans Advocate Times-Picayune and co-reported the film, The Parish Prison. She, he did that along with filmmaker Joanne Elgert Jennings. At the Baltimore Sun, Mr. Stoll covers Maryland government and politics. He was an investigative reporter and Washington correspondent for The Advocate in New Orleans, covering crime and criminal justice. In addition to the parish prison, he and Ms. Jennings produced two stories for PBS NewsHour Weekend about ICE detention in Louisiana jails. And last, Captain Byron V. Williams, Jr. He's the Director of Educational Programs and Reentry Services for the Plaquemines Parish Sheriff's Office, featured in the film, The Parish Prison. Captain Williams' work includes implementing the goals of the Sheriff's Office, focusing on improving systems that deliver successful services. He provides leadership in achieving the department's mission and believes that education is key for re rehabilitation. Prior to this, Captain Williams was Director of Public Service for the Plaquemines Parish Government. He has also a background, he has a background also as an educator and mentor. Welcome and good evening to all of our panelists. Mm -hmm. And to our audience, if you are watching and you have questions, we ask that you just type them in the OV chat box and we will get to as many of those questions as soon as we can. So our first question for our panel this evening, we'll start with Ms. Jennings and Mr. Stoll. For the film, The Parish Prison, you collaborated together to report on Louisiana's new reentry programs about the Plaquemines Parish Detention Center. Describe for us how your collaboration came about for the story. So um, when I heard that Independent Lens was looking for films about local jails, I was reminded of a story I reported um, shortly after Katrina about the criminal justice system. And that's when I first learned that more than half of um, the state's inmates are serving time in local jails. Um, I had been following along really excellent reporting in what was just the Times-Picayune um, and then became the advocate Times-Picayune. And when I was taking a look to see what you know, was happening now, I, I ran into Bryn's reporting on the criminal justice reform and was intrigued, uh, especially hearing the Secretary of Corrections refer to these facilities as lock and feed, made me think that maybe he was serious about doing something about the problem. So then we met Bryn and his editor. <laughs> And, and I had covered the, the, I had covered the 2017 um, criminal justice reform uh, legislation, the legislature, 
um, and, and, and also been, had been doing some writing about um, ICE detention in, in Northern uh, Louisiana jails as well. And was kind of, and was interested in trying to explore and follow up on how some of those reforms were being implemented um, and how the, the state's sort of patchwork system of, of jail, of local jails and state facilities was adjusting to a smaller prison population after post reform. Thank you. Thank you for the, what motivated you all to do this work. It's a fascinating, uh, fascinating production. Uh, Captain Williams, we're coming to you next. As someone who directs the reentry services that we saw, have you seen consequential differences in the lives of those who, who took part? And, and if you have, are there examples that particularly stand out for you? Yes, absolutely. So on the side when the individuals are currently housed at our facility, we have case managers that meet them at their needs. So we tried to find out what were the difficult situations they had to encounter and why they're here. Also, we had to look at when they go home. So we have the wraparound services where we work with Catholic Charities and Goodwill Services to make sure we're attacking it from both ends where they have a outpatient case manager and an inpatient case manager. And they also meet prior to them meeting weekly with the guys that's in their catchment to make sure if they have any internal issues going on while they're here in the facility, they're making sure they're passing that on to the outpatient case manager, which comes in as well. So just making sure that if we can find out what their needs are and their risks are, we can make sure we can come up with a devised plan for success. All right, definitely providing that continuity uh, from one, one state to the next. Ms. Johnson, as, uh, as an attorney working with the Promise of Justice Initiative, you work to ensure that there is as much equity and integrity within the criminal justice system as possible, and we thank you for that. Uh, the parish prison shows us that some progress is being made. So how do you think the citizens of Louisiana can make a difference and best engage policymakers to affect change where we're still falling short? Yeah, thank you. The parish prison, piece talks a lot about those who are in for shorter periods of time. And as we talked about, not everyone who is in the parish prison system has access to the education and the case management and the support that we're seeing in Plaquemines. There are folks all through the state of Louisiana who are in this lock and feed situation where there isn't enough funding within the facilities to really see a difference. And the, pr the problem with our mass incarceration system is that we incarcerate more of our population than anywhere else in the country. And it really becomes an issue for all Louisianans to understand what's happening in their communities and what happens to their community members when they are sent to these parish prisons or sent to state facilities. We all want the best outcomes for our community and what we can see are models that work and models that don't work. And we've learned so many of Louisiana's older models aren't built for, for success. Right, uh, we have a question that's come into the chat box for uh, Captain, Captain Williams. And thank you for the audience for sending that question. Uh, please continue your questions. Uh, Captain Williams, what is the recidivism rate for inmates that participated in, in these reentry programs? Currently, that data has not been collected, but per our deliverables of our contract, it's 20% or less. Um, working along with probation and parole, I know they're collecting that data and also being uh, working here for almost six years, we do have some recidivism, but those individuals they still need help and they need service because once we um we all realize one day they are going back into our society. So we have to make sure that we're giving them the tools and resources they need that they can be productive and find what is their career path and what is their career goals. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Jennings, uh, we're gonna come back to you. You've produced stories from around the world, incredible work from around the world. Is there a common thread to the stories on which you report? And if there is a common thread, how was that evidenced in the, in the parish prison? 
I would say uh, I like to approach, I cover some pretty heavy topics. Um, I've been in war zones and places mm -hmm. like that. And um, I like to approach uh, telling a story about a problem by looking at people who are trying to find a solution or trying to address it. Um, I think in the process, you get to understand what the problem is as well. It's, I'm not suggesting that it's, you know, problem solved. And I think that that was the case for parish prison, as Jamila pointed out, uh, Plaquemines Parish is, a, is an exception uh, currently to the, to the rule. Uh, and, but it was, um, you know, we, Captain Williams um, and his colleagues at the prison, I mean, at the uh, jail really invited us in and were open about showing us their facility and talking to people who are incarcerated there. Um, and so I felt like we got a chance to do it. Uh, I also have just drawn uh, often to criminal justice stories. I've been to jails um, around the United States, um, in Haiti, in South Africa, and I've seen a range of conditions. And um, I'm just still blown away by how many people we incarcerate in, in this country, um, such a wealthy country with resources. So. Yeah, this is, a, again, a fascinating conversation and one that we, we need to continue to have and then start to move the needle in, in a lot of these areas. So thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Stoll, since you're reporting on the parish prison in Louisiana, you're now reporting on government and politics in Baltimore. Are you seeing any common threads uh, that cross state lines when it comes to criminal justice reform? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the... Um... The last 10 years um, in the U.S. Have, have really seen, it's a concerted effort. Louisiana forms sort of part of a concerted effort nationally to, to reevaluate um, incarceration. The, the justice reinvestment uh, model that the Louisiana legislature went through in 2017 was like very self-consciously copied from a number of other, mostly uh, Southern uh, red states that had tried to make kind of similar um, both socially oriented, but also fiscally oriented reforms of their prison systems that cut down the size of the prisons. Um, there's obviously a big criminal justice uh, reform pushes all over the country and, and, and it's taking place in Maryland too. And I think in some ways, Maryland's kind of an interesting um, mirror to Louisiana. It's a, a very well, like probably the second richest state in the country, whereas Louisiana by some measures is the second poorest. Uh, a deeply- yeah, I was thinking about the differences between the two. A deeply blue state versus a deeply red state, you know, um, and and yet, you know, in a lot of ways, struggles with very similar challenges in the criminal justice system. There's, there, there are unique things about the way Louisiana chose to structure it, uh, its prison system, especially with the heavy use of local jails, um, which which has a, a long and interesting history and is probably kind of in the in the long run created some real problems for Louisiana. But um, the other thing I'll say is though, I, I moved up here to the sun at the very beginning of this year. And mm -hmm. um, it's hard to really say um, that, that the COVID pandemic has, has really upended life in prisons in a, in a really dramatic and serious way. Um, you know, that's probably the population besides maybe nursing home residents that have been like probably most acutely affected by the pandemic in some ways. And so it's, it's, it's probably hard to you know, really evaluate what has been happening in, in jails and prisons um, over the last year and a half, because I think uh, a lot of these efforts to change programming, deliver programming have all been just totally derailed. Um, and, 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 and I think probably, hopefully a lot of, I, you know, people will get back to that kind of work uh, eventually, but, you know, a lot of prisoners have been under strict lockdowns with programming is canceled and um, the logistics of that has been terrible. Yeah, that's something that will probably need to be studied at some point, the effects of COVID on those types of things in, in incarcerated settings. I thought it was unique how the zoo crew did manage to uh, at least take three inmates <clears throat> and still have them work with the zoo, uh, even though they were housed at the zoo as opposed to at the facility, at the prison facility. So, um, you know, different strides are being made in, in little ways, uh, thanks to COVID, unfortunately. So uh, Ms. Johnson, I'm gonna turn to you uh, real quick for a question. Uh, can you speak to the statewide access that exists for the types of services that uh, we've seen in the, in the um, parish prison? Yeah, so if we've talked a lot about this 50%, 50%. 
Um, 50% of the people who are incarcerated in Louisiana's prisons are in these larger state facilities. Um, in those facilities, they tend to have jobs, right? Those jobs are varied in, in different forms, but mainly relate to making the prison run or pr prison enterprises making money for the prisons, right? Less geared towards developing the skills that would be necessary to come home, right? Um, very often utilizing practices, techniques that are antiquated and are no longer in use in the outside world. Um, and with very limited access to training, primarily set for those who are able to come home the soonest. Um, in small parish prisons who may be hosting um, or holding individuals who are serving their state's time, we see individuals who would do anything to get some course access, would do anything to be moved to a facility where they could learn a skill, could really address the issues of their addiction, who could get the training to be able to hold a job after incarceration. And what we get most often are requests for transfers to facilities where there might be a job program or transfers to a facility which might have a better chance at education. And so what you have is this patchwork of individuals who it seems much like the luck of the draw, whether you're going to get a chance to really gain the skills to be successful when you come home. And that shouldn't be the way that our system operates. Yeah, that, that is very interesting. Uh, thank you for that, Ms. Johnson. Uh, Captain Williams, another question is coming to the chat box for you. Uh, we're about to head to you uh, for the next question, but it's kind of popped up at the same time. Uh, is, is your funding limited to parish appropriations or are you authorized to raise funds in other ways like foundations, grants, private donations, et cetera? We're under contract, or the, our sheriff is under contract with Louisiana Department of Corrections, where we service four parishes, which is Jefferson, Orleans, Plaquemines, and St. Bernard. Um, I'm not sure of the outside the box thinking, but I'm quite sure if that's proposed to the legislators, that may be something they can look at as well to help increase the funding to service more populations. Right, increase the funding through outside other than, you know, public appropriations, uh, other ways that they yes, can do that. Uh, Captain Williams, I am, I am going to go back to the question that I uh, had for you prior to the chat box question, and that is, uh, is the investment in reentry programs continuing? And are you able to track the progress, including for those who return to life outside of the de detention center? Yes, we are continuing. And um, to piggyback off of Mr. Brian's, or Mr. Bryn's, um previous answer, when we were in the heart of the pandemic, we still, we worked along with DOC to devise a plan to do corresponding courses for the um, offenders and then made sure that we would grade and check once we have sanitized the work and responded back to them. So we still had operations going. They were not, you know, at 99% bore, but we did have educational contact with them in some way and up on um, us having the governor's blessing to start back. We started back in January where we followed all of the CDC guidelines, had the PPEs in place. And um, so we tried to do our best to not just fall off the face of the earth because we know any education or any knowledge these guys have obtained, they would lose it if we were not trying to still push them or steer them towards being an um, eternal thinker. So um, with the education side of it and then going to the statistical side of it, I guess we are collecting that data. And I think I answered that a little bit previous where probation and parole, um, they have two tremendous um, agents that are working alongside of us that when we send out our transition plans, it's the plans that our case managers devise for these individuals. We deliver the transition plans along with birth certificates, IDs, um, Medicaid, Social Security cards to the district, whether it's Orleans or Jefferson um, probation and parole office. And that's how the, the agents are able to track who's come through our program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for both of those uh, questions that, that hit you. Um, 
I, I want to talk a bit about everything that we've seen this evening. Uh, we've also watched Zoo Crew and Constance. And like the parish prison, these films provided examples of programs that offer participants greater self-respect and confidence. And so as, as they prepare to return to their communities and the, the notion that incentives work better than punishment, uh, what are your thoughts? Would you, would you all like to comment on, on the films that we've seen, uh, the other two films that we've seen this evening? Uh, I oh, saw please, Joanne, I know you first. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Joanne, we'll go back to you. Oh, I, I thought they were really um, interesting uh, stories that they told. There, there was something though that came up for me in Zoo Crew and I'm just curious what Miss um, Johnson and, and Captain Williams think about it. I, I think, and I've seen, I've spent time uh, in prisons and have seen that work programs and training and education really do make a difference. But um, at what point when you have work um, that is valuable to a state or society, and they're, they're being compensated pennies. Um, how do we, as we move forward and, and implement more work programs, which I think we all agree is necessary, how do we do that ethically? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on, on that as I think you probably could guess. Um, but the first is that work should be voluntary right? Education, I feel like can be compulsory, right? But like work really should be voluntary. Um, minus the fact that the 13th Amendment has exceptions for those who are facing punishment for a crime. Um, work has a really dangerous history in our country when it's compelled. And so work programs that are voluntary that people can choose to be part of, which Zoo Crew seemed to highlight, is like the first, I think, ethical step. The second ethical step is that nobody should do work in unsafe conditions or unsafe work, right? And we've seen a history of that with programs. And so if we can make sure that everybody is engaged in creating safe workplaces, like that is sort of one of those ethical zones. The second is that people should be compensated fairly for the work that they're doing. And that compensation should be allowed to go back out to the communities for the people who've been left behind. These are fathers, mothers, sons, daughters. And the way that we schedule and put these compensation systems benefit the state and private entities that are part of this partnership, but are the, the product of the labor of the individuals who are in these programs doesn't go back to the communities where they have left and don't go back to their families. And so creating programs that allow some of that money to go back and to compensate better is, is helpful. And the last is what I mentioned a little bit earlier, which is making sure that like the programs that we have available contribute to someone's success on the outside, that they give skills that are practically usable, that someone can get a job with. So with Zoo Crew, you saw the responsibility aspects, being somewhere on time, having tasks, that translates. But the thing that we can do that's the most helpful is really give people skill sets that they can use in the market and identify those and help people translate the work that they do while incarcerated to the jobs that they can see in the future. Uh, sorry, that was probably longer than anyone yeah, was anticipating. Yes. So on no, our but end- it was, it was full. So, yes. On our end, yes, I can't Captain speak- Williams, Yes, ma'am, on our end, I can't speak towards the work release programs because I don't, you know, we don't have a work release program at this point. Um, but currently we do have a partnership with Home Builders Association where we partnered with the Home Builders Institute and the individuals in the New Orleans metro area who are home builders. And we currently have the Home Builders Association curriculum in our carpentry program. So those individuals who do have a high set or a high school diploma or a college degree, and they want to get into the Home Builders association program, the carpenters program, we call it Carpentry 101. These guys go through 20 weeks of rigorous training and also will help them to have gainful employment. But the key to that is we have the partnership with the home builders. So upon these individuals, before they get released, they're interviewed by the home builders. And when they're released, they will be hired on the spot. So gainful employment, and work release, I, you know, I can't talk about the work release, but if we can teach these guys how to fish, opposed to giving them a fish, 
we have great success rate with those guys who have come through the Carpentry 101 program. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Bren, any thoughts on your end? Yeah, I guess I would, I would just add that um, one thing that has always struck me uh, visiting prisons and interviewing prisoners and, and speaking to people who formerly being incarcerated as well um, is um, almost universal eagerness that you encounter to be able to participate in almost any kind of programming um, and, and often to do a lot of work. Now, um, I'm not really sure if it's my place exactly to comment on some of the ethical implications of that, um, but I think there's like kind of two way, two things you can draw from that. I mean, you could you could see that as um, that there is a real you know real in, interest in 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 the, these kinds of opportunities, which are highlighted in, in those other films. Um, I think I think there's also probably a way to read that as um, how how deprived um, a lot of prisoners are of, of real opportunities while inside. Uh, that that there's some that, that there's often you know real intense competition and interest in holding jobs even for you know pay that, that can amount to, to pennies an hour uh, sometimes um, so I, 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 I that has just always struck me and I think that, that those films highlighted that as well. Uh, I want to ask Captain Williams, uh, can you comment on, on what incarcerated individuals are facing once released and, and more specifically about the things that we that we take for granted, like the ability to drive a car, communicate by phones, you know, technology is moving very quickly, things have changed while the, the inmates have been uh, incarcerated. How are we helping in, in those ways to transition? Bringing in the community partners that we work with, as we indicated, I indicated earlier with Goodwill and Catholic Charities, these individuals, the, the hardest thing that we hear when we do case management is they need money now. And then when they get out, they don't have a place to stay. They don't have a job. And also they have not been in contact with their family um, or their um, spiritual leaders. So. One other program we're currently working on right now, we're trying to pilot with DOC, is um, the family rehabilitation program to make sure that they can rekindle some of these relationships, whether it was a former boss, whether it was a spiritual leader, whether it was a mother or, or their father or sister or brother. So we just wanna make sure that once they go home, they have resources. So um, as we say in the Southeast region, and I'm quite sure it's everywhere, the first 72 hours for these individuals is imperative that they have a support system to surround them so that they do not recidivate or they do not fall back into the trap of being the person they once was prior to coming to prison. So the, the most important thing is I think to have that family support to know that for the first three to six months, I know I have someone that's gonna be on my side if I'm going to get additional training upon going home because these guys have been incarcerated. Some of them that come through our program have been incarcerated for 30 years. And like you said, using a cell phone or even a computer or driving, those things are challenges. So if you have that family support, um, that's key, I think, most definitely. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I want to remind our audience uh, that we want you to share your feedback with us by clicking the orange button on your screen. It says participate in the survey. Uh, by clicking that uh, same invitation you see in the chat box, either way you can get you to the survey. One survey taker will win a year's membership to LPB Passport. It's our online streaming service of the best of PBS. So we want to remind you to take that survey uh, this evening. We want to get your feedback on everything that you are experiencing uh, on this program with us. So I'm going to ask a few more questions. And if you have questions, please put those in the chat box. We're getting to them as, as we can. Uh, Ms. Johnson, this one is for you. Uh, what role do you see activists and advocates playing in creating change in the criminal legal system? And I know you talked about this a little bit, but what activist groups are inspiring you with the work that they're doing? Yeah. Um... I mean, I think by all accounts, I'm probably considered an activist, right? Um, but I don't really like that language. Um, and the reason I don't like that language is that I think like part of being a citizen of this state and someone who's part of the community is caring about what happens 
to our neighbors, what happens to our loved ones, what happens to, to those who are part of our community that are taken out of our community and, and put in incarceration. Um, and so I don't think it's an activist act to want to make sure that people are safe um, or an activist act to want to make sure that there are strong government program like actions happening that allow people to re-enter with the supports that they need. Um, but things that like groups that are exciting me right now, um, you know, I am particularly excited right now about forward.us, fwd.us, um, less of a Louisiana community group, but they've started some really great work this week on people first and some of the language that we use. Um, you know, these are fathers, mothers, neighbors, kids. And when we use language like um, inmate or offender or felon, um, they've done research to show that that changes what we think of their stories and makes us less interested in success for, for people as they re-enter. And so they've, they've just published some great research on the language we use in things like reporting and conversations like, like these. Um, you know, Voice of the Experienced is always doing really exciting work as formerly incarcerated individuals who are giving a space for people who've come home to stay connected to their community in incarceration and to lower barriers coming back. Um, something Captain uh, Williams mentioned, um, Ramilla is an organization, Reentry Institute, Mediation Institute of Louisiana that's doing exciting work. They are working on training formerly incarcerated individuals to be mediators through mediator training to go back and mediate disputes between people who are incarcerated and their family members so that they can re-enter with the disputes that may have existed when they became incarcerated resolved, right? Um, so that they can be successful. So it's both training in how to do mediation, but also skills that help people through their re-entry. And they can mediate with anyone in their life who they think their re-entry would be assisted through that mediation. And then Louisiana for Prison Alternatives, it's really a legislative arm that seeks to, um, to make change, to realize that you know, in some ways we, um, we have to fully shift like who is speaking to legislators about incarceration so that it is more community. It doesn't feel like activist or somebody who this is their pet issue, that it's just really part of being in Louisiana is caring about this issue. Yeah, definitely, you know, caring about the, the human nature of, of what, what's happening here is important. And the organizations you named, I wanna commend them as well. You know, they're very passionate and persistent uh, in their work. And so uh, hats off to them. And again, we have a, a long ways to go in, in this arena. Uh, last couple of questions, uh, actually, to Ms. Jennings and Mr. Stoll, uh, as, as our filmmakers here, do you have any additional observations and takeaways to share with us about your reporting in the parish prison? Yeah, um, I would say one thing that, that I guess I would want to say about it, it, it always strikes me whenever I work on reporting on prisons, especially this kind, which, which really involved, and th thankfully, we did get a lot of access. Um, we went to to three or four different facilities, um, you know, and, and Plaquemines are very kind to, you know, let us interview any number of inmates, gave us a lot of time. Um, how difficult it is, though, normally uh, to do reporting in prisons, um, you know, these are secure facilities that are often under pretty tight control of the state. Um, and in a lot of places and in a lot of circumstances, it is often very difficult to get sort of access to have frank interviews with inmates and or you know to be able to you know have frank interviews with staff and discuss what conditions are really like and what is really going on in these facilities it's hard to make time for it i think a lot of people see it as like a lower priority uh, issue and also these are facilities even though the, the the people who are living there are you know say from new orleans these are our community members uh if you're you're working for the local paper there um they are, you know, locked up often in sort of far-flung corners of the state. So just logistically, it's it's hard to to keep, you know, Cotton Port is not, for example, is not you know part of the Northern Metro area. It's kind of a long trip to get up there. Um, and so I do I do think it's really important to make time though to do that reporting. And also I you know I am thankful in the in the occasions when we've been able to convince um, 
the authorities uh, to allow access for this kind of journalism. Um, and, and I hope that, you know, things like this hopefully will continue uh, because I do think it's really important. There's a huge prison population in Louisiana. It costs an incredible amount of money. A huge percentage of people in Louisiana have family members and friends and uh, relatives or, or, or have been victims of crime and the, the people who victimize them uh, are in the prison system. And what matter, what happens there is like deeply, deeply meaningful. It's like one of the most uh, intense exercises of state power. So I, I, it's just, it's, it's a really difficult bit of reporting, I think, but I think it's also very important and, and hopefully um, access, uh, we continue to prioritize access for the kind of journalism. I was gonna answer this question diff differently, but after hearing you, Bryn, I, I um, have a different thought. Um, I, you know, after covering criminal justice so much, um, I decided to volunteer uh, at a local uh, or state prison that's not far from where I live in California, San Quentin State Prison. And they have a media lab there where they do um, a lot of, um, journalism that the the inmates are the journalists they are the filmmakers they are the um podcast producers and um i think that it's valuable for everyone first of all the people i've seen who've gone through that program and have since been released have gotten really meaningful jobs with benefits and pay and are have, have entered society and have benefited the community that they came from by setting an example um, uh, but, but also I think it's important. I do think it's important for journalists to get access, but it's not the same thing. And so when, when, when people who are incarcerated can tell their stories, um, I think it's super powerful and important for, for everyone involved. Um, I've seen prosecutors interested. I've seen victims groups come in and, and benefit from it. It's, it's everyone. I, I know it sounds like we're just talking about the, the people who are incarcerated, but as Bryn said, it, it, it affects all of us. Um, so that that's um, something that I would encourage. Definitely. Uh, we have, well, an additional question that's popped up in our chat. Uh, I'll direct this to you, Ms. Johnson. Are there counterpart reentry programs in the juvenile justice system? And if so, what are the interactions among the programs? So yeah. that, that your organization is aware of on the juvenile side. Yeah. Um, so there are um, locally in Orleans, I'm aware of a program that I'm not 100% sure is still in operation, but um, that was setting up uh, like internships with people as they came back through from, um, from incarceration. And so we would um, get a intern who had been trained to like then work in the criminal justice field. So as a nonprofit in the criminal justice world, we would have someone come to us who's been trained to be able to, um, to, to work in like a legal nonprofit space and um, then have the option to keep that, um, that employee on longer past their internship. So I think we're going on two years with the individual who we got through this program and it's been incredibly successful to, to see that transition um, through, through the facility. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure that it's still operational in this way. And so that was a, ju a program for juveniles? Mm -hmm. juvenile Through Orleans. Years. Yeah. And the name is escaping me. Got it. My apologies on that. <laughs> now we have a lot going on. We're glad that yeah, you could share, share that information. Uh, Captain Williams, a, a question for you as well. Is there one program that stands out uh, most in terms of making a difference uh, in, 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 your, in your jail? Um, are, are they all equally important? I know you mentioned the Carpenter program, but are there, are, is there any particular program that really made the most difference in your mind? I think in my professional opinion, all of them are equally important due to the fact that we've been in operation now for six years. So we had an opportunity to massage this living document several times to get it to this point. And knowing that um, the criminogenic models, we're looking at needs and risk, so upon orientation, the first week that those individuals are here, we do the DSM-5, which 
um, tells us if they have a substance abuse issue or a um, mental health issue. Um, I'm sorry, a substance abuse issue or alcohol abuse issue. And um, on the flip side, we do a psych social to see if they have any mental health issues. One great component we have added as well is a psychiatrist that comes in for our mental health population for those individuals who identify to make sure that if we do not have the resources here, we can give a referral to a state facility that can give them the services that they need to make sure that they are being met at their needs. But um, I think all of the programs that we do have in place have been devised for individual um, individual evaluation plans, IEP, to make sure that in their transition plan, when they report to their probation and parole officer, they know the issues and needs that these individuals may have and making sure that once they get home, they're also getting outpatient services, the wraparound services. So we take a holistic approach in how we deal with each individual to make sure that, like I indicated before, we don't have a cookie cutter program. Our case managers do a great job and we have an awesome sheriff and an awesome warden as well. Love it, shouts out, awesome sheriff, awesome warden. Uh, things are going, things are happening in Plaquemines Parish. Thank you, Captain Williams. Uh, I, I certainly wanna stop here and say, uh, Ms. Jennings, Ms. Johnson, Mr. Stoll, Captain Williams, thank you all for the time you've shared with us for this discussion this evening. And for those of you attending, uh, we want you to watch your email as we will send you the survey. In case you have not yet shared your feedback, you, have, you still have a chance to do that. Remember that when you complete the survey, you will be entered into a drawing to win a free LPB passport membership. And LPB looks forward to keeping in touch with you. So please uh, reach out and give us your feedback on that survey. Once again, in addition to our wonderful panelists, LPB would like to extend our thanks to our partners who helped to make this event possible. The Southern, Southern University and the Southern University Law Center, PBS, Independent Lens, and Independent Television Service, known as ITVS. Uh, thank you also to the Promise of Justice Initiative for supporting this event. And Stories for Justice is made possible with the generous support of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the Ford Foundation, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, Winecott Foundation, and Park Foundation. So again, I want to thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, and certainly, I got a note here in the chat box. It is the welcoming project, Jamila. Thank you for that. The welcoming project. So thank you for that. But again, thank you everyone for joining us. A special thanks again to all of our panelists. I'm Robin Merrick and for all of us here at LPB, we're wishing you a very good night. <laughs>